is Bro Perkins. I'm a medium, and I've been giving psychic readings for 20 years. My mission is to demystify the mystical and educate the public that we do not die, and life is about growth. This is ARC, the Afterlife Research Center. Cyrus Kirkpatrick is a spiritual journalist by his own admission. And he travels the world. He's uh, been within my own personal circle for many years. I only just met him. But he interviews psychics. He interviews scientists. Thank you for joining me. And uh, you're all the way in Indonesia, as you were telling me before. And I've been following you on YouTube a little bit now, too. So I I'm aware that uh, you've been exploring life on the outside thinking of new ways to live outside the paradigm. And, and uh, right away, I connected with you on an intellectual level. I'm like, how the hell do I don't, did I not know about this guy, uh, Cyrus Kirkpatrick? So welcome to the show. Hi there. Nice to be here. <laughs> <laughs> You're the author of something like four or five books now. Is that right? Um, I probably have about 20 books floating around, and uh, two of those books are about the afterlife. So your newest book about the afterlife, The Afterlife and Beyond, is of particular interest to me. First of all, I mean, I told you a little bit about what we do on, on this show here, uh, where I interview experts like yourself, and then I'll do a reading in the back uh, on a person. So my, my job as an evidential medium uh, over the last 20 years or so has been the source primarily for me for all of the insight and, and, and perspectives I have on the afterlife. Um, I'm getting it sort of through the dead. They trick a little bit. So, I mean, most of the time they're just giving messages to their family and, and bringing up memories. But we also have uh, moments where I'll have a flash into what they're doing on the other side. Where is the other side? What the heck is it all about over there? So where do you pull your source of information mostly from? How, what, what are your avenues of research, would you say? Uh, I basically came down to a, a period of just uh, mass reading books. So everything from like Dean Radin's material mm -hmm. to uh, like Tom Harrison, the physical medium, to mm -hmm. spiritualist books, uh, Geraldine Cummings, uh, Minnie Harrison's um, chronicling her, her work, physical medium. Mm -hmm. I could probably just keep going down a list of, I suppose, the stuff I was reading and I was into for, for a long period. And of course I still am. Mm -hmm. And I was piecing together like a more big picture idea of, of what, what, what this afterlife is like. But things definitely changed around 2015 because that's when, actually really 2014, I began having a lot of out-of-body experiences. Mm -hmm. So then it really shifted from just studying the afterlife and like having one foot in and one foot out, like not, not being a full believer, but being, you know, like 60, 70% there to going into actually going there, going to the afterlife, having astral projection experiences and meeting dead people. Mm -hmm. It's been a couple of times, a couple of pretty well-known dead people and getting information straight from going there. So that's, that's the big thing that changed. That's why I wrote the first book because I had spent maybe a year having those experiences and deciding, okay, now, you know, I, one hand, I have all the research I've done, but now I have spent a year actually going there and being able to confirm what's accurate and what's not accurate. Uh, one of the chapters of your book has to do with myths and uh, misconceptions about the afterlife. And, and so I wanted to sort of veer more into that. I think that's a good focus for today because I can know we're gonna have more conversations and we're probably gonna have a lot to cover over, over the time. But um, first of all, m like I was saying earlier, people have trouble conceptualizing what the afterlife is and where it is and, and how you can measure it. And one of the, the, the things that has occurred to me is just because something is difficult to detect doesn't mean it's not real. I mean, only very recently, I think in the last 35 to 50 years, we've been able to actually see an atom. We couldn't see them before. We had theories about them for over 100 years, but we've only just learned to see the atom. And, and that doesn't mean that they weren't there, right? And so 
And it's also very hard. You can't just see an atom. You need like a $5 million electron microscope <laughs> to be able to do it. So the spirit world, as far as I'm concerned, is something like that. It's not easy to call out. It's not easy to see. And you need specific tools, like in the case, maybe you have to go to a medium or maybe you have to have out-of-body experiences of your own, right? So but you've actually gone and had experiences in the spirit world and, and you've actually compiled volumes of data over the last two decades. So what, in your own words, are some of the most interesting misconceptions you've come to define? Well, I mean, I, I have quite a few. I wouldn't be surprised if I ended up mentioning something that isn't in one of the books because I always have like new thoughts coming in. And one that kind of came to mind just now mm. concerns the idea that there's only one kind of afterlife that everybody goes to. So this thing, this idea really gets pushed out there by the very well-intentioned near-death experience community. So there's a lot of people who believe that the afterlife it is the white light. So you die, you go into the light, and then you're going to spend the rest of your existence just in that white light. And divine love and bliss, and that sounds great and all, but just, just, just floating in that white light. And that, that, that's, that's all of existence from, from, from thenceforth. And I think when I was first researching this, as you were when I was also a teenager, that kind of terrified me because it was one of the first things that didn't seem right to me. But I was, I was hearing people talk about this on websites and interviews and basically saying completely matter of factly, when I die and return into the light forever, I, you know, I, I can't wait, blah, blah, blah. And so then I would read like a near-death experience where somebody went to like a garden or a temple and there's a civilization. And I'm like, well, how come one near-death experience is that there is no civilization, that there is no like community or existences of people? It's just a white light forever and ever and ever and ever. And then, you know, then of course you have the other side that says that, you know, it's just go this one place. And then I would dig deeper and find that the people who say you just merge into the white light, they start coming up with excuses about why people have experiences in temples and forests and gardens and cities. They say, oh, well, that's just a temporary thing that you experience to reacquaint yourself until you merge back into the white light forever. Mm -hmm. And now I'm just, you know, then I started reading about mediums, talking about people's lifestyles, and I keep hearing these excuses getting made. And it starts to click. It's like, look, this white light thing is some kind of temporary experience that people have when they cross over and they meet like their higher self. But, but now we have taken that as some way to cure all our problems. So it doesn't matter what you did in this life or whatever, you know, whatever the issue might be, you're going to go back into the white light and be in that white light for eternity. So um, great. So now there's nothing else we have to worry about. We don't have to work on ourselves or, you know, make up with family members who we don't get along with or um, make up for bad things we did in this life because we always go back to that same, like, kind of like cosmic drug trip that never ends. So that that's is a, that's a good of, opening to a comedy is like, uh, you know, you get to this great blissful white light place where you're like forgiven. And then, and oh, this is great, man. Uh, this is where I'll be. No, no, this is just the waiting room. Now you've got to go and fix it all. <laughs> like, that's actually, I'd say that's literally kind of what it's like, because look, here's the deal. So I, I go, I ask the project. So first of all, the, the spirit world has all these gradients, which it's not really a spirit world. It's um, these different wavelengths of dimensions. So the one that like a lot of people go to when they die, we kind of colloquially call the astral plane. So it's actually, it's, it's a real physical solid place where you actually have physical bodies, believe it or not, which are kind of like copies of your body here. So you, you just move to this different frequency basically. And there's, you know, cities and there's people working freaking like uh, night shifts at restaurants. Like, you know, it's, it's crazy. It's, 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 you know, it's very different in a lot of ways and in very similar and like, like ways that always make me laugh. So, you know, so I, on that side, when I talk to people about like their death experience before they went to that side, like they, they, they might describe like a near death experience, right? So they left their body, they were brought to like a light, they had a life review. And so I was asking my father about this. My father died about five months ago. And so I was asking him about this. Basically, he got, you know, I said, hey, dad, so what happened? Did you get like a life review? And then he just burst into tears. He got super emotional. 
it's like, I don't tell many people this, but I saw everything that happened to me ever. Like, like he was super like emotional and it had been eating at him because I mean, he wasn't always the nicest guy in the world. And I think he got a huge dose of like self responsibility that finally hit him. But the point is, is he's on that side and just doing his own thing and going out and partying and the stuff that he likes to do. Mm. But he had had a death, you know, what we call a near death experience. That was his actual death experience. So he didn't just end up in that white light forever. He had this transcendental experience happen and then he was plucked down in the astral dimension. So, so that is my determination because then I, you know, I can, I kind of get that same story from different people I talk to. That is to say people, people living on that side who died here, but I also meet people on that side who were born on that side. And to them talking about this world is like talking about paranormal subject because they've never been here. They don't know what it's like. And it scares the hell out of them because they hear other people talking about their experiences in this world. Right. So those people I talk to who, you know, who did die, who came to that side, again, you know, that's kind of how, how they've described it to me. But some people don't want to hear this because they want to say, well, we just go to the white light forever and ever. But that's, in my own experience, I don't think it's really that like that. And, you know, I've talked to some really good mediums. And then, you know, I've had mediums bring forward the same people I've talked to on the astral plane. Like, hey, there's somebody who wants to visit, and <laughs> there's somebody, I, somebody that I've met on that side. So, I mean, to me, it just all kind of clicks together, even if some of these ideas is not what people want to hear. And there's a lot of people who don't want to hear what I just said. Oh, absolutely. Key word, responsibility. And that's what a lot of people who are even religious um, and, and in some form believe in there being more, but they're against there being an afterlife because, again – that makes them have to be responsible because I always say, uh, since you can't die, you better like your roommate. You got to live with yourself. And the key word is, so when you, your dad, I wanted to go back to this for a second. When you got wind of a life review, uh, you and I know what this is, but for the audience, can you go into some detail about what that even means in the spirit world? What is a life review? Uh, to get, to get very technical, what happens is that all the information in the universe basically gets recorded as Edgar Casey said, the Akashic record. So all of that is basically in a cosmic database. So a very advanced, higher density entity, higher than fourth density up into like six, seven, eight, like a very advanced entity has full access to that. And they can basically come up to you and take like decades of information and just dump it into your head. So it's like an information, this mass download, it just hits you. So like within a moment, you can get all, you can get your entire life, just download it back into your, into your mind. And so if you meet like the quote higher self, which seems to be a real phenomenon, it exists rather maybe, maybe like the, um, the head of the group soul that you belong to, you know, maybe there's hundreds of people in your group soul. And there's this one kind of like, nondescript entity that that overrides all of it so when you meet that that entity is powerful enough that it could just take all your whole life and they just send it back into your mind so then you'll know everything you've ever like all, everything you've ever done will be back in your memory at like the forefront and you'll also know the feelings and reactions that everybody else around you has had so if you did something mean to somebody when you were a kid like now you'll know you know that kid you bullied, you'll know how they felt. So in a nutshell, that's, that's, that's a complicated topic, but that's, that's what we're talking about. Right. So you'll, you'll relive essentially um, in a split second, everything, and, and you'll know why you did what you did and you'll know how it affected everyone around you for the first time, because we can't have all that information in physical form. We just are so limited. I, I, I describe mm -hmm. being in a body, almost like viewing a painting through a straw. You know, our scope mm -hmm. is so limited here. So that's really fascinating. Yeah. So, so that goes against everything, doesn't it? <laughs> Your definition of the spirit world goes against religion, that's for sure. Well, um, I'm actually a little bit curious, but I want to maybe throw it back at you a little bit because you're a medium. Um, does any of that jive with you? Because it, 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 interestingly enough, like I do meet people who say, hey, Cyrus, you're completely off base. That's not how it is at all. And I do respect that those opinions. It's just that, you know, between me, myself, and many out-of-body experiencers and mediums and 
people have researched and physical mediumship, like it all kind of points to my experiences, but I do have to listen to people who say, no, it's not like that. So I was wondering, how, how do you feel? Does any of that resonate with you? Because the way I see it is that, you know, we have this astral level, but then we, we have other levels above that. So some people like, you know, they, they because it's so vast, people, let's say somebody, um, belongs to a group soul that's like very, I don't know, like extraterrestrial, right? And they have a near-death experience. They meet all these entities with like bodies of light. They look kind of like that creature from like the abyss or something. Now, very, not at all very human-like. Mm -hmm. But we have to understand that, that that was just their experience. So I guess what I'm getting at is that there's many varied experiences, but it's like most of us who die go to this kind of astral dimension. So that, does that make sense to you at all? Have you had experiences in that type of world? Well, yeah, um, I, I have. And everything you're saying certainly lines up with my experience and, and, and what I've seen. Um, I would go even more general and say that just as our body has an astral body, every planet has an astral body of itself. So it's like all bodies in, in the material universe have spirit bodies, if you will. And so, like you were just saying, um, it's possible that even intelligent extraterrestrials are in the spirit world, maybe on their planet's somewhere else in the galaxy and beyond and, and everything right and so oh, yeah yeah it's well you know it's not just that they have a spirit body well what it is is that this entire universe is duplicated so if you want to know the size of just the astral dimension it's the size of the entire universe mm -hmm. so so the entire spatial territory of this universe is copied over directly and it's very much like the same universe just on that other wavelength. So yes, you can go to um, a planet here and it, there may be no life on it here. If you go there astrally, there may be whole cities of people living on that planet. Something occurred to me while we were talking, I was listening to you just now, which was that there was a point in history where medicine went from believing that leeches could cleanse and purify the blood, which isn't true to what is now more modern medicine and maybe what we're starting to see very slowly in our world is um, our world being the world of paranormal research is that religion and spirituality is starting to make that step towards something more legitimate where we actually start to explore this and, and, and not just challenge the assumptions and the, and the doctrine, but, but even go with the data and go with and, and and follow where it leads you know there's a lot of ways that this stuff is already in our culture and i talk about that a bit in my books as well that it's uh you know it's a kind of it, it is like really rooted into culture um so even so it's just beneath the surface i guess well that was a really awesome conversation with my friend cyrus uh he's got this great new book it's incredibly insightful You've got to read it. Get it. Uh, my son, he was my, my oldest son. He passed away in 2006. He was 18. We got these after, after he passed away, my mom and I, because that was his saying, everything happens for a reason. There are spirits all around you. Andrea, like, I've got mostly men, first of all, although, is your mother in spirit? No. Okay, there's a grandmother then, Correct. and she's an M initial. I don't think it's the one you're thinking of. But then, there's these two men. One's, um, one is young. They both lost their life too early is what I feel. Um, oh. I don't get emotional usually, but I feel something. Like I feel absolute, like my heart's been torn from my chest. Did you lose like a, a, a grandson? Um, or, or son? Son. He was going from a friend's house to home about 10 o'clock at night, uh, Young Street in Aurora. He, him and two other friends were uh, crossing the road, were really unsure if they were playing a game, if, were unsure what was happening at the time. 
they ran across the road. He got through three lanes and was hit in the fourth lane. Um, the car didn't actually hit him. His knee hit the um, front tire of the car and spun him flying. And um, I'm told he died instantly. He's right here with you. And he was bugging me all morning, I'll have you know. Like, on my ass. Get your ass up. You don't know what's happening today. Blah, 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 blah. And he's just been hounding me, and I've had anxiety up through the roof. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's what he makes me feel. Was he young, like a 20-year-old or something, like teen or 20? 18. On the cusp, right? He tells me, bro, I took um, my hands into my own life. But tell them all I love them and I've never left them. Not for a second. Does that make any sense to you? Yes. Okay. On oh, this time of year, it's very important. Is right around the 13th or the 3rd or something of March, is there, a, is there a connection in this time of year for yourself with an anniversary or for him? Um, today is the anniversary of my grandmother's passing. Okay. So she was the one, the one who's got him. Now, who's the M initial in the spirit world for a woman? Um, but you have his father's side to think about, too. Correct. So, yes, and, and I don't know them right. that well. Fair so. enough. Bear with us, then. He's real cute, though. He's got, like, a... He's got a shag with his hair, and he's kind of, um... He's wearing, like, a tie-dye shirt. And he looks like a... Like, a, like, like he's making me feel like he'd, um... He likes my beads. Yes, he yeah. would. So we know I have an unusual name. Correct. He's got an unusual name, too. He does. I have no frigging clue. But he's just like, forget it, bro. You're not going to get it. He tells me, he shows me his favorite time of year is the fall. Is there something about um, foliage or leaves? Um, only if it was marijuana leaves. <laughs> no. <laughs> to be honest. That's legal in Canada, <laughs> Rogers. Oh. He's saying, he's calling me stupid, and he's telling me that it has to do with his name. But I don't, oh, I don't oh, get it. I don't okay. get it. Okay. Yeah. Should I tell you his name? Not yet. Okay. Leave that till the end. See if I can piece it together. He's telling me I'm an idiot, though. He's kicked the chair. <laughs> <laughs> he's a sweetheart. He is. But he says, Mom, I didn't suffer. It was quick. It was quick. Did you give a present? Like, you kept... Like, after he died, like, the first Christmas and things, like, you got him a present still. Yes, and every gift I gave everybody had something to do with him. Him. And it's like you keep giving presents that have to do with him, and he thanks you for this. And he's there for all of them. There's a new baby. Has there been two children since his passing? There has been. I have a grandchild. One, and then not another? Because there's a new baby. Oh, the new baby is... Um my cousin's baby no 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 you might have another grandchild sometime and if it's coming through in this reading it has to be within let's say two or three years 
Is it even conceivable to you that that could happen as a possibility or? In the next two or three years, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. And I feel someone taking his name. Which might give it a clue to the gender of the baby. He's got a blue Mustang <laughs> in the spirit world. His dad will understand the reference. Are you not with his father anymore? No. But his father will understand the reference. Can can one of, uh, one of his siblings relay the message? Yes. He doesn't want to put you in the awkward position of having to tell his father that you were on a Rogers television show. We speak, so it's okay. Well, <laughs> that's good then, because you can get the information because there's a blue Mustang or a muscle car. I don't know cars. My dad's a car guy. I'm not, oh, obviously. Now, um, he's got the dog. He's taking care of the pup. It's a darker dog. It doesn't look uh, very, very big. It's a medium-sized I'd say a mutt. I don't think it's a purebred. Um, was this a dog from his past, or the family had put it down? My mom had a, a dog that we were all very close to mm -hmm. that um, had to be put down shortly after. After your son's passing? Correct. Your son has that dog. He's taking care of it. And they're telling me that the whole family's with him. And James, or Jim, is up there. Do you know who that is? Jim? James? Mm -hmm. Yes. Is that your granddad or uncle? No, that's that's a, a very close friend's father. So it feels like a granddad, right? It, well... Or a father, he, uncle. Was, he was a father figure to a lot of people in our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Jim's up there. When did he die, though? Because, because your son makes me feel like they've all welcomed him over. Yeah, it was after life. Yeah. You said Leif? Oh, so, yeah, Leif. That's, Leif. that's his name. Weird name. I, yeah, I wasn't supposed to, to say that. <laughs> but that's the foliage. Yes. Mm. As soon as you said Leif, then lots of people mispronounced it that way. Oh. That's why he's kicking the chair saying I'm an idiot. Leif. How do you spell that? L-E-I-F-F. -F. So it looks like Leif. If you look quickly, yes. Leif. What, what kind of name is that? Is it Celtic? Norwegian. Oh, beautiful. Oh. But he never, he was Canadian. Correct. I just liked the name. Well, it's beautiful. And my, uh, my sense is he's also, um, He's just started showing me cards. Um, it's, this isn't that important, but it feels like he's with his family and he's playing cards. So the old boys that are from before his time have all taken him under their wing. He's quite a, um, a social charismatic kind of person, your son. Yes. And I feel like he has a full life over there. And. He's very fascinating, fascinated and interested in coming back to visit and assist with your, your life issues here. And he whispers in your ear, and you can't hear him, of course, but you feel inclinations to, to hold back on certain things or to, or to assert yourself in certain areas, in particular, like maybe with a grandson um, and speaking your mind in the future. And, and such, because he's trying to influence you and, and trying to be a part of the family still. And you are open. You don't even have to think about it. It just happens. He's part of you. He forgives his father. His father never hurt him, but he wished he could have been more like, like this. Do you understand? I do. And he loves his dad, and he wants his father to understand this and know it in his heart that his son is with him forever.
James is a cool guy. They all love James, Jimmy Boy up there. And he looks like he's 32 again. Oh. <laughs> mm. He was an old boy, but he looks like he's 32 again. Did you paint your kitchen or, or move into a new one? He's wanting to show me a, a butter yellow and he wants you to like brighten it. We uh, just moved about a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. I did paint it. What color are you? What color is the kitchen, I mean? It's a very pale gray. All right, put sunflowers in there. He wants some yellow in there. Maybe when he was a kid, your kitchen had that tone to it, though. There are these layers in readings, right? You have to put it all together. Mm -hmm. Do you still in the closet where the linen closet is? Do you still have the, the blanket of his? Yes. He, he, he thinks it's pretty cool. I don't know if it's like a stupid hockey or some decal on it, but it's just cute. And I think you're going to give that to a grandchild one day who's not yet here. I think you're going to recycle that to a grandchild. And um, do you have two daughters? Two daughters? No. One? One, yeah. Why, why do I feel two daughters? Is there a daughter-in-law or something like that? No, I have a daughter. And okay, because your daughter will take on that blanket and, and she'll keep it safe. She will never get rid of a single thing. Yeah. When she has a child she, for that. I think that's what you're saying. She has a daughter. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you've got two daughters because you've a got daughter a daughter and, and a granddaughter. granddaughter. Right. Perfect. Okay. But you're going to give L Leif, mm -hmm. Leif's blanket down. You're going to hand it down. You can cut some out of it, eh? And put it into a quilt or something. You can take a piece. Mm -hmm. He's saying mum won't let go of anything. That's true. But, but, but he's recommending some things. You have to understand that it's not your fault and nothing you could have done would have changed anything. That's what you need to understand. He's wanting, he's very forceful about this. He takes full responsibility. How, how did he pass? He was hit by a car. Okay. Was he on a bike or walking across a, a side, not a sidewalk, but an intersection? Um, close to an intersection. He was walking across, yep, four, four so lanes. So he wasn't traffic. in a car, but he was walking. Correct. Okay. Running. No, he's saying no. Was he on a skateboard? No. Not that I know of. I believe he was walking. He, he's adamant about how it's no one's fault. It was a complete, complete accident. Because when they take total responsibility, they're either putting themselves in harm's way or they're causing the harm to themselves. Correct. He does not blame the driver. That's all I can infer from that message. I mean... Very sudden, no suffering. <laughs> yeah. And they worked on him. They took him to the hospital and worked on him. But he was already in a coma then. Correct. So it was like three and a half hours of, of work or resuscitation or something, and he was gone. Correct. But, but he was not suffering. I think he was already with one of a, uh, either his one of his grandmothers or a great-grandmother. He was with one of them. You need to know that. Is there an L initial in the family? Yeah, that's my grandmother. So it was your, it's his great-grandmother. Lynn, Lynn or Liz? A Lorna. Yeah, Lorna. Because it's like an L-N that I wanted to say, but it wasn't quite Lynn or Liz. So he's, he, she came to get him, and you, I don't know if you know much about Lorna, but she was a force. Yeah, so maybe I'm not thinking of the right person. She passed after him. Mm-hmm, um, that's true. 
you might not be thinking the right person, but there's this grandmother energy, but his father side's a whole other dynamic. Correct, to think about. yes. But there's a force. There's a force of a woman with an L name who was right there and by his side. Yeah. And don't worry. He, he, he doesn't leave me with any unfinished business. He makes me feel like he was the type to just do as he wanted. Because on some unconscious level, he knew he didn't have a long life. So I believe, and, and most of my family believes, that he knew that his days were numbered and his time was coming. He gave us lots of, in hindsight, little indications that he knew. He was really fixated on the number 33. He told me, I see the number 33 everywhere. What isn't 33 adds up to 33. And, and uh, he talked philosophically a lot about those kinds of things. And, and in hindsight, we all believe that he knew that uh, his, his time was coming a lot sooner than it should have been. So he took in people's suggestions, but he was like, screw you. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> oh, he loves all of you so much. So, he shows me that you're not supposed to be alone, and he guides your hand into the hand of another. Have you reconnected with um, a partner? Are you, are you open to this? I just recently got married. He's congratulating you because he wants you to know he's happy about this. But you knew this person before? Did you reconnect or were you introduced through acquaintances that you both knew? We were introduced through acquaintances that we both knew. That we both had the same friends for years but never met each other. You were in each other's orbit and, and for many years. We lived in the same town um, 10 years mm -hmm. prior but didn't know it. Yeah, and he wants you to know that he guides your hand into his hand. And he's very happy. He likes this guy. This dude, but he, he shows me a bit of a beard or scruff. Did he shave it off? Um, no, no. He puts it all around like a, yeah, maybe like, cause he only shaves every three, four days. So that, oh, well, you don't know. Maybe he's thinking about growing one Maybe. and you're going to hate it. Probably. Yes, I will. <laughs> he likes him. He likes him. Total approval. It's like guiding mom's hand into the hand of another. It's taken a long time. Because even though your son had passed, you had mentioned 12 years ago. Correct. Um, have, you been a, have you been single for something on the order of 14 or 15? Years? Yeah. Yes. Because or before, before meeting him, the guy that you're married to, your husband, but then you are together now. Were you together with him for five years? Your husband? Um, Five or six. Like currently? Uh, yeah. I'm with my current husband, yes, six years. Yeah, that's what I'm seeing because he's catching me up. It's like he's telling me your story because he wants you to know he's watching. It says mom's a boring reality show. <laughs> Not as interesting as the Kardashians per se or. But here you are on Rogers television. So yeah, it's a step up. <laughs> But he's very proud and he's happy. Does this man have two kids or two grandkids somehow? He has three. Because I'm putting two kids under him. And if he's got three kids, is there something like two grandkids or is it possible he might have two grandkids? No, uh, twins and one other. Maybe that's why he only had two pregnancies. Correct because there's two sets of kids, but, but he, your son makes me feel like it's all one family now and, and all of you connect and you love his kids. I do. Yeah. They love you too.
No, because he says that when he passed, um, people blamed the driver, like he was speeding or something. But it's not, it wasn't anyone's fault. It was a pure, pure, pure accident. So even random accidents are meant to be. It's a bizarre thing, but even random accidents are meant to be. We can't understand that from our point of view, but when you're in superposition, when you're in a spirit form, before you're born, you plan out your whole life, and you plan out all the big um, instrumental lessons, and then you plan out even how you pass. And your family allows you, like you plan to have the son that you did before you were even born, and you plan to go through all of this to learn and grow, and you're more spiritual. I know, you'd give it all back to have him here. I would. But I don't think we could pay him enough money to have him here. I think he's having a great, great time where he is. Because you're free. You're free of pain and death. But you trade it all back. I know, Mom. I know you trade it all back to have him here. What? Like you planned to have the son that you did before you were even born. And you plan to go through all of this to learn and grow, and you're more spiritual. I know, you'd give it all back to have him here. I would. But I don't think we could pay him enough money to have him here. Because he still exists in a new form. And this is just the first, in a sense, contact. It's not the last. Um, He's been leaving dimes as well. He tries to do that from time to time, move objects. It's not the greatest, not the greatest sign. We find lots of dimes. Yeah. <laughs> He's joking. He's not the one making the fuses blow. That's just our equipment, frankly. But he's laughing because uh, we would superstitiously apply this to him because the equipment keeps blowing. But I have to laugh because I was telling my producer I want less lighting on me. And I've, maybe it's my power is making the freaking thing go off. Um, wh where is that, like a Tom or a T name, Anthony or Tom, Tony? Do you know where that is? No, not offhand. Okay. Oh, yes. Who's that to him? Anthony is the name of the driver of the car. Tony. Anthony. Yes. And he's living. Correct. Because your son sends his love to Anthony. Because that... Um, Young man, he wasn't—he wasn't even thirty, I don't think. Was he something like twenty-eight at the time? Exactly. He was twenty-eight. He has nightmares about this. He carries this with him, and Leif has tried to absolve him of that, but only he can forgive himself. And if you give Tony to God and give your son's blessing to him, his soul can heal. And it never really will. Did you prepare questions before this? I did. Okay, and you and I have never met. Do you want to read out your questions and I'll see if I see any visions in, in response to them? Lots of them you've already answered. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good. You have them in the sealed envelope. That's excellent. Good. So, should I read them all or just the ones we haven't addressed? Yeah, the ones we haven't addressed. Let's try that. Um, so I wanted to know um, if he was around my son, Bailey, if, if, if... Bailey was much younger than him? Yes. Like something on the order of um, 10 to 15 years? No, eight. Eight? eight. Yeah. How old is Bailey now? Um, isn't this crazy? <laughs> Oh, take your time. Um, 22. 22, eh? Handsome boy. And so what's your question there? I just want to know if he's around him, if, if he spends, like, ba Bailey still 
is having a hard time, so. He is, um, he has a message for his brother. Who needs enemies when your friends are stupid? So tell him that for his brother. And he wants him to pick himself up and don't smoke so much. And I don't know what he's talking about. I have no idea what he's talking about. But I have this feeling like lift up like the phoenix from the ashes, the phoenix rising. That's what he's trying to tell me. Does that make any sense to what you know? Um, it does a little bit because Bailey has a tendency to lift up and then kind of fall back down again. And crash, yeah. But but he's a very strong person and he always comes back. But I, he he does get a little bit depressed and a little bit overwhelmed. So and I think like, he's a bit of the uh, takes in the underdog and tries to save everybody. So it's like choose your friends carefully. Make sure your friends are people who hold you up, not just you holding everyone else up. That's what he wants to let his brother know. There's a lot around relationships right now, so Bailey might be going through some relationship lessons. Yeah, I, I think fa some with family a girl, friends, he With a family member, but with a girl, but with his friends, like at all three levels. Okay. Sorry, what were you going to say? He, uh, him and his, girl, his girlfriend broke up not too long ago. Very recently, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the phoenix rising from the ashes. Who needs friends when you have... Uh, who needs enemies when you've got friends like these? Who needs enemies with friends like these? And you have stupid friends. So his brother's with him through this difficult time. Okay. Um, okay, so the other thing was about the dreams. You've already addressed that. Mm -hmm. The dimes. You wrote about the dimes? I wrote about the dimes. Perfect. Um, what am I, a psychic or something? I wrote about the lights flashing. Uh -huh. Well, um, hello. <laughs> <laughs> but that happens in my house as well. Yeah, well, this hasn't happened quite like this before here. And I'm, I'm wishful thinking, but... So I asked if he knew his life was going to be short, because he always lived his life to the fullest. Because he didn't give a shit what yeah, people yeah. thought. That's what he said. Those it were his, his words. It was his life to live. That's right. Yeah, and, and everything happens for a reason is something that he always talked about. He lived such a fast, adventurous life, and he did whatever he wanted. And we all strongly suspected that he knew hmm. that uh, his life was was not going to be a long one. Not not going to be long, on an unconscious level. Correct. And he mm -hmm. started to talk about it about a year prior, and that he was seeing signs. And what did he say? He was talking about uh, numbers that he saw that added up to uh, to. Uh, a certain number and, and uh, that it meant things and that he he knew that his days were numbered and like he just really mm. but I always just said oh don't be silly mm. on the other hand a lot of times I said to him because he did such crazy stuff a, a lot of time I said to him Leif you're gonna kill yourself no mom I'm fine I'll be mm. fine don't worry I'll be fine he always said to me so mm. So it wasn't that he put himself in harm's way and that he was going to kill himself, but it's that he knew he wasn't going to have a long life, so he said, let's have fun. Yeah. That's what he did. That's what he was like. That is exactly mm -hmm. what he was like. You only mm -hmm. have one life to live, and, and he lived it fast and on the edge. Mm -hmm. It was a lot. I felt a lot more peaceful than I thought I would. I, I Not that it wasn't emotional, but I thought that it was going to be a lot more sad but I, I feel really good about uh, uh, of the things that he told me and and uh, I feel a lot more at peace than and I feel like I'm glad I waited the length of time that I did uh, kind of gives everybody a chance to absorb and rebuild and, and get past their grief a little bit more and look at things with a more open mind whereas if I had been told the things maybe even six years ago that I was told today, I, I might not have taken it the same way, but uh, yeah, I, I knew he was gonna come through because he's, it's just him. <laughs> so I think what surprised me most about what he talked about was um, him telling me that uh, 
Leif didn't take his own life, but he put himself in the position where, where his own, you know, if it happens, it happens kind of thing, because Leif, he lived his life like that. I, I mean, he did crazy things. And, and one of my major questions was, was his, his death an accident? Or, you know, was it somebody else's fault? And I'm glad that he told me that he takes full responsibility and that it, I, it just is, the answer is exactly not what I was looking for, but it, it just is life. It's, it makes total sense to him and his personality and what he would have done. So I, like, that's the, I think the most impacting thing that, that I was told today. As we've lived 12 years with the why, like, I mean, the why, you never know, but life always told me everything happens for a reason, so that's how I go every day, and that's how I deal with it. But, um, because we've had the question of what happened, we never really knew what happened exactly. He had two friends there, and of course, you're 18 years old, and you're, you're watching your friend die. You're not thinking clearly. You don't remember exactly what happened. There were witnesses, but it was 10 o'clock at night. It was a little bit dark. We never really knew exactly what happened. Um, although we knew what happened, we didn't know the circumstances leading up to it. We didn't know, did the car hit him? Did he run into the car? Why? So I feel like just with that little small thing that bro told me, I suddenly have all the answers I've been looking for. So that's where the peaceful feeling comes from. Wow, so who would have thought a decade ago I volunteered at this hospice and I had to actually, I was 22 at the time. I know I look good now, but I was going through a heartbreak at the time and I got a message from Spirit telling me to go volunteer somewhere and it gave me this vision of a house which was up the street from where I had lived. And I went and it was a hospice and uh, I walked in and I said, I think I need to be here. They said, who the hell are you? And I said, I'm a psychic. So anyway, uh, I got folded into the ranks of hospice um, King Aurora and I had this group of teenagers given to me who had all lost people close to them and lo and behold Paige was one of my kids and I haven't talked to her in at least 10 years if not more uh, and here's her mother on my TV show so that was amazing and, and uh, I didn't understand why I got so emotional at first um, in the beginning of this reading but uh, I had felt the loss between a mother and a son, which is very difficult to convey on camera if you haven't had that happen to you. I've never had it happen to me, but there you have it. It was, it was a very emotional experience, and uh, I'm just very privileged to, to have made that circle complete. thing I said to my husband this morning and he's like how do you feel and are you okay and he's like doting like over me mm -hmm. and and I said this is a very good way to describe it imagine your child has been in another world for 12 years and they're gonna fly to a new destination and they're gonna fly through your town mm -hmm. and they're gonna have a stopover in your town but they're not gonna get out of that plane so you only have a very small window to get your message across and they get their message across to you but you can't communicate directly and then afterwards they're going to be gone again so that's the way i explained it to him how i felt all day leading up to now mm -hmm. so i said if you only have that small window you you got to make it right yeah that's a beautiful analogy yeah so the perfect thing a stopover yes yeah that's yeah. the way i kind of had to describe it to mm -hmm. him so Wow, beautiful. Yeah.